a bunch of conceptual problems just kind of get your brains warmed up. If all the masses in each one of these cases are identical and all of them are stationary, in which one of these would the tension be the largest? In which one of these would it be the smallest? I'll give you a second to think about it. The correct answer on this one is, of course, D. No, just kidding. They're actually all the same. Um, the tensions are exactly the same here because each one of them are holding up one mass. Um, the tensions are the same throughout the rope. Pulley just changes direction without changing the magnitude. Um, what about this one? Two weights are attached to the rope and suspended by pulleys. The weight's different in the two cases, but they're both at rest. Rank the tension in the ropes. Well, if you solve this one, you'll discover that the tension is, of course, 80 newtons here of this thing stationary, 80 newtons here, and because it has to be uniform throughout, A, B, and C are all at 80 newtons. Whereas D, holding up a 40 newton object, is going to be 40 newtons. E is going to be 40. F is going to be 40. These are all 40. So what's the correct answer on this one? Whoops. From greatest to smallest, the greatest tensions would be A equals B equals C, which are all greater than D, which is equal to E, which is equal to F. Good. Um, so here's a quick question. You've got the gymnast hanging on the ropes here. Is the tension in each one of these ropes 250 newtons each? More than 250, less than 250. The answer is a little bit interesting. Because these two vertical components both have to be 250 newtons, and we're dealing with a right triangle, each one of these tensions, therefore, over here have to be greater than 250 newtons. Does this make sense? Um, in this case, both of these are identical. Um, both masses are identical. In case B, the angle beta is smaller than the angle alpha. What's going to happen to the tension in the horizontal rope? What will happen to the tension in the angled rope? So what's going to happen here is this. You've got this tension acting here. Whoops, sorry. Let me draw that better. You've got this tension acting here. Whoops, that's really drawn bad. This one here, and of course the weight of this thing here. I'll try to draw better this time over here. So what happens as you make the angle smaller? Um, if you take a look at the components, we've talked about this a little bit before, um, what must be true here? Well, this vertical component here must be exactly equal to the tension in this rope here, the weight of this object. And this horizontal component must be exactly equal to this piece. The same thing is happening over here. This horizontal piece here has to equal this horizontal piece. And this vertical piece here has to equal this vertical piece here. Um, what happens if you make this smaller? What happens to this tension here and this tension here? Um, for this, let's, let's give this some masses real quick. Let's say this is 100 newtons, or a weight. If this is 100 newtons and this angle is very small, to make this side 100 newtons and this side is small, this is going to have to be very, very large. Whereas here, if this is a, still 100 newtons over here again, this tension here doesn't have to be nearly as large to get the 100 newtons over here. Um, so what's going to happen to the tension in the angled rope? This is going to be larger here than it is here. And what about the tension in the horizontal rope? Um, if you make this shallower, this side here now is going to have to be greater than 100 newtons, whereas here, if this is like, looks like it's about 45, this is going to be 100 newtons. What's going to happen? This is going to become larger, which means this horizontal one's going to be larger as well. So what's going to happen, as you make this angle smaller, both this tension and this tension will actually get larger, which is kind of cool. Um, this one here, um, they're all moving at a constant velocity, all of these pods. Um, 
rank the tension in these pods as they move at a constant velocity. Well, let me find the constant velocity. So in this case here, what has to be true about the tension here compared to the tension here, compared to the tension in the rope here, compared to the tension in the rope here? Um, if they're moving at constant speed, this, there's supposed to be outer space here. Um, what has to be true about the tension here? How much tension or how much force is required to keep this pod moving at a constant velocity? Remember, there's no friction in space. So what's this tension have to be to keep it going at a constant velocity? The answer is, bizarrely enough, zero. And the same thing is going to be true here. What's the tension required to keep both of these pods moving at a constant velocity in space? Even though this one has more mass than this one, three times as much, the answer is zero. What's the correct answer to this one? Believe it or not, all zero. Um, take a look at this one. It's another conceptual problem. Three teams are pulling on a tire. Um, and the tire is moving to the west at a constant velocity of one meter per second. Which team is pulling the hardest? Well, first thing you have to understand is this. If it's moving at a constant velocity, what must be true about the sum of the forces acting on it? Remember what Galileo said. The sum of the forces must be zero. So the tensions produced by these three teams must add up to zero. If we look at it real quick, there's the three tensions. What has to be true? This component of, of team one's tension has to be equal to the tension applied by team two. And the horizontal component of T one's tension has to be equal to the tension applied by team three. Which has got the, who has got the greatest tension or who's pulling the hardest? The answer is T one. And you might say, whoa, wait a second. Didn't you talk before that tensions have to be the same throughout a rope? Yeah. Um, but in this case, we're talking about three separate ropes. The tensions are not necessarily the same. And in, if you work out the math, mathematically, T1 has to be bigger than T1 and T3. T2 and T3, sorry. Um, one of the things that drive students crazy a little bit is the idea of mass in space. Yes, mass still works. Um, take a quick look at this video, if I can get it to play. Maybe not. There we go. Hello, Jeff Williams on board the International Space Station. We often get the question, how do we weigh ourselves in space? Well, if you uh, are, have been introduced to physics, uh, or mathematics, perhaps you're in college, uh, or you will be in college, and I uh, get introduced to calculus, you'll hear about uh, differential equation, and a uh, typical uh, uh, equation is a spring mass damper equation. If you know the properties of a spring, and you know a damping ratio, uh, then you can measure the mass. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple problem of physics, and that's what we use here. We have this machine here that's got a, a known spring constant and a known damping ratio, and we've got it set up here, and I'm going to release it, and it's, you're going to see it's going to oscillate at some frequency here, and we're going to go through a calibration. It's going to release. You see it's got a very predictable frequency here, and it's calibrating itself now. And we have an electronics unit over here that uh, gives a readout of the weight, and right now, like I said, it's uh, calibrating. So I'm going to reset it, and we're going to change it to the working mode to measure the body mass. I'm going to get on it, and now since we've got my mass on it, the frequency is going to be much less than it was during the calibration. And, and then we'll take that frequency, the known spring constant and the known damping ratio, and calculate my mass. So here we go. And after about four calculations, we have a readout. 81 kilograms, a little more than that, 81 and a half kilograms.
So it's relatively simple, relatively simple mathematics, relatively simple physics, and a very precise way to, uh, to measure our body weight while we're here on the space station. Okay, here's the spring inside. And I'll stop it there. Uh, you have the rest of the period to go ahead and do the worldwide data day calculations or measurements. Make sure you put those in the Google spreadsheet and to work on the worksheets.